Hello, and welcome to Z Taxi. Today's topic is what men don't know about female selection. The internet has caused a surge in awareness on this topic in recent years, giving the current generation a unique advantage in comprehending female mating and dating behavior more precisely and clearly than ever before. While some of the information available on the subject was unavailable to men even 10 years ago, I believe that it will ultimately benefit both men and women since it is now more widely known. One of the most important concepts in this information cache is hypergamy, or the propensity to mate and choose men who, for example, in today's talk, I want to address two common misconceptions about hypergamy held by men. These misconceptions roughly correspond to the two general reactions men seem to have when they learn about the reality of hypergamy. Hypergamy influences almost every aspect of female sexual selection and has a number of significant downstream consequences, so it's really, really important to understand this concept. The first is the most common since, regrettably, it matches the more typical response of men. In summary, many men, especially young men, become very discouraged when they learn about the sexual selection criteria used by women. They hear that women are only interested in the top percent of the top 10% of men, and they think to themselves, well, I wasn't in the top 10% of men in high school, college, or young adulthood. As a result, they incorrectly conclude that either A, they could never enter those upper echelons, or B, that even if they could, the time and effort involved would not be worth it. In other words, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Or, I don't have anything that a woman will really want, why bother? Or something along those lines. Men initiate most interactions. So they disproportionately face more rejection than women do at the beginning of a relationship, and women end most relationships. So men disproportionately face more rejection than women do at the end of a relationship. This rejection can be hurtful in many ways. These men may be rationally concluding that a high-risk, low-reward endeavor doesn't make sense for them. If we were talking about investing their money, we would call this decision prudent, and no one would have a problem with it. On the other hand, lots of people seem to have a problem with the same decision being made about women. These men need to grow up, stop sniveling, and frankly fall in line. This is hardly fair and would likely make a good topic for a future video. However, my point here is that these men misunderstand the payoff of hypergamy after all the time and effort expended to align with the criteria of hypergamy. The payoff is not that a woman has ultimately provided security and material resources, or even that a man is offered sex and a relationship. The payoff is the growth and prosperity that are read on to the man as a result. What does this mean? A top 10% man can only indirectly benefit a woman, and then only if she can acquire and maintain access to the man. However, a top 10% man directly benefits himself. He directly benefits from being stronger, wealthier, and having a higher status. These things are primarily good for him and, at best, only secondarily good for others. Even if much of his wealth and status are stripped from him by a divorce or a breakup, which can certainly happen in today's society, he remains the source of that value. And he became the source of that value in the transformational process of becoming a top 10% man. So this is the first misunderstanding about hypergamy that it primarily benefits women, it doesn't it primarily benefits men and can only indirectly benefit women, namely, if a man chooses to bestow the benefit upon her now before I'm going any further. If you're liking what you're hearing, please consider sending this episode to someone who might benefit from its message because it's word of mouth referrals like this that really help to make the channel grow. You may also consider hitting the super. Thanks button those three little dots in the lower right hand corner and tip me in proportion to the value you feel you've received from this episode. It's your donations that make all this happen and I really appreciate your support. Now, not all men get discouraged upon learning about the realities of hypergamy. On the contrary, a smaller subset of men get fired up. These guys are energized by what they see as a viable path forward, they think. Fantastic with this information, I can kind of hack the 
Game I think I can align myself with female selection preferences by analyzing what actually works in terms of mating and dating. Let's go get this bread. I can get rich, I can get fit, and I can get smooth. In many ways, this is an adaptive response because, as previously mentioned, all of these things directly benefit the man in question. However, in my opinion, this is where men are frequently, shall we say, deceived, because in actuality, women don't actually give sex to men in relationships simply as a result of men meeting their selection criteria. The notion that implementing behavior X will address issue Y is a masculine approach to problem solving that is transferred onto women. Men hear that women want a guy with a six-pack and a six-figure income, and they think great if I get these things. If I'm finally what women want, then that means that women will reward me with sex and relationships. It's the same mentality that believes that if I buy her a drink, listen to her problems, and show my value, then she will reward me with sex at the end of the day. Writ large and the disappointing reality is that this is not the case sure all other things being equal a woman is more likely to choose a guy with a six-pack and a six-figure income over a guy that doesn't have those things, but it's not true that the vast majority of women will choose a guy just because he has a six-pack and a six-figure income these things might make it easier for a guy to get his foot in the door but it's better to consider meeting women's hypergamous criteria as a necessary but insufficient condition of sexual opportunity unless you are like world-famous women aren't going to be lining up to date you even if you have all of the things that hypergamy says that women are looking for a good-looking brain surgeon can drink at the bar by himself all night. And this is because despite the fact that the man may have worked 10 to 20 years to meet women's hypergamous criteria he has to start from scratch with. Every new woman he meets like he could be a successful handsome eligible bachelor who has worked hard for years to earn his social proof and status, and he will still have to start at square one which for a lot of women means convincing them that he's not a serial killer like can you imagine a job interview 20 years into your career in which the interaction begins with the default assumption that you are fraudulent embezzler until proven otherwise and this is what happens with women they have. To feel safe, they have to feel heard, they have to feel like you're attracted to more than their bodies etc. And if you say one thing that they don't like too early in the interaction, poof, the opportunity vanishes in an instant. And while it's true that the more a woman is attracted to you, the easier this process becomes, you don't get to bypass this process. Just because you've got biceps in a bank account, indeed, you have to begin with women right where you would have if you hadn't spent 10 or 20 years. Building your status and lifestyle, namely at zero, and if you spend all that time on your abs and income, and you never learned how to seduce a woman, you're probably not going to get as far as the guy who spent a year learning how to seduce a woman and has neither the ABS nor the income well, sadly. Fulfilling women's hypergamous requirements is not the magic bullet that many men assume it will be. In fact, the majority of these requirements are what I refer to as attraction proxies. The underlying message is that, even with all the trappings of a successful man, dating a woman won't be simple. Even if you are in the top 10%, it doesn't mean you won't still need to approach people, put in effort, and successfully charm them. 001% it doesn't alter in the top 10%. But I'm not sure whether I'm there yet. Being a high-value man does not automatically translate into easy access to sexual opportunities, which is a bitter pill to swallow. Even if you are a neurosurgeon and a professional underwear model, earning seven figures annually from shelters that take in abandoned puppies, the woman will still question herself about things like, does he remember the day we met? Did he open the door for me? How does it make her feel? Does he make her laugh? And does he look at other girls in a way that makes our kids' hands look funny? This is the second misconception about hypergamy. Meeting hypergamous criteria does not guarantee sexual opportunity. Behind the hypergamous criteria of female sex, there is an almost endless list of personal criteria that each individual woman must meet. Failure to meet any one of these criteria could result in the removal of a sexual opportunity, regardless of how many other criteria are met. Interestingly, both of these myths tend to encourage men to distance themselves from women, which is something we're definitely witnessing more and more of these days. What do you think? Does this match your personal experience? Please let me know in the comments section below.
If you made it this far, you might also enjoy this episode. And please subscribe to this channel. Thank you for listening, as usual.